Barry. Mm. Thank you for all your power and your grace, dear baby God. Amen. 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 Let's dig in. Yeah, we're going to take prayer advice from Ricky Bobby. Oh, hey, I'm so glad you're here. I'm Keith, one of the pastors here at Christ Church, and uh, thank you for joining us online. We are always uh, glad and honored uh, for you to take some time and, and to join us for worshiping God and hearing from uh, God's Word. Uh, we are in this series called God is Listening on uh, Prayer. This morning we're going to look at uh, several different scriptures. Prayer makes possible the impossible. We pray because we have a God who is able. And yet there's so much about prayer that we don't understand. In fact, there's so much about our prayer that uh, we rationalize out and come up with excuses as to why we don't pray or we don't pray more than we pray. Came across a list from a pastor who just wrote down several excuses that we use. And I don't know, maybe all of us have used some of these excuses as to why we don't pray. I don't have time to pray. I don't know how to pray. I tried before and didn't get what I wanted, so I don't think it works. I'm not sure there is a God. I think there is a God, but I don't think he's involved at the level of my little life. My mind wanders when I pray. If I try a formula for prayer, it feels contrived. If I freestyle, it feels confusing. I'm not spiritual enough. I'm too cynical. I'm too tired. I fall asleep when I pray. I'm afraid if I prayed, God would make me change things I don't want to change. Other people seem to hear God when they pray, and I don't hear him. If God already knows everything, my prayers wouldn't change anything, so I don't know why I should bother. I did something bad last night, so I'm in a spiritual timeout today. I'm too extroverted. I'm too introverted. The dog ate my homework. It's amazing how we will come up with all kinds of excuses and rationalization for prayer and the reason why we don't pray and we try to manipulate things. And we really do want prayer to work. I mean, we want that. Uh, and we wonder, why does it not work? And it's interesting what we do because whenever there's bad stuff that happens, we place that on God. But whenever good stuff happens, we want to bring that on ourselves. And so bad stuff happens in our world and we say, where is God? Why didn't God do something about this? How can you pray to a God and have faith in a God who will allow something like this to happen? It just doesn't make sense. Bad stuff happens and God gets the blame and then good things happen and we think, man, I crushed it. I killed it. Or we try to, try to control what the prayer thing is. And a part of the reason why we do that is because in our minds, and I don't know how we got this, either from uh, Sunday school or Catholic school or our parents, somewhere along the line, we grew up with this mentality about prayer. And that is that some prayers work and some prayers don't work. So that's what we're trying to figure out is how to pray a prayer that works. What's the formula for a prayer that works? What's the kind of heart I need to have for a prayer to work? And what doesn't work is because I want to avoid all of that which doesn't work. And what we have to realize is that prayer is not a work, doesn't work kind of thing. Prayer is a relationship that I have with God. And in that relationship, there is communication going on. We are conversing with God. That's what prayer is all about. But we have this whole work thing about prayer. If I take a flash bulb and I turn it, uh, press the button and it doesn't turn on, it just doesn't work. If I get in my car this morning when it's cold and I turn the ignition and it doesn't start, it just doesn't work. And so we apply those things to prayer and prayer is not a this works and this doesn't work because when I'm talking to a person, when I'm talking to somebody, when I'm talking and conversing to a being, if I make requests of Betsy, if I say, Betsy, I know you have a full-time job and I know you wake up early when you really don't want to get out of bed and I know you work late and you're exhausted when you come home, but on top of all that, what I would like for you to do is to make me biscuits and gravy and sausage every morning, come home and when we go to bed, I want you to scratch my back for 30 minutes while we're in bed 
and I want you to wash all the clothes, fold all the clothes, put up all the clothes. I want you to change the, or put gas in your car and change the oil in your car. And when you have time, do that in my car as well. Do you think you could do all that? And if it didn't happen, would you say that my request just didn't work? Yes, my requests weren't working. No, that's not the case. My mind might have not been working. But if I were to make all those requests and nothing happened, you wouldn't say, well, it, your requests, they just didn't work. And yet we apply that to God. The same is true with prayer. We can't take some kind of wand to work magic and say, this works, and if I don't apply it over here, that's not going to work. And one of the most frustrating things about prayer is this thing that is so-called unanswered prayer. It's whenever you pray for something and nothing happens. You pray for weeks or years about something and nothing ever happens. And you're wanting to know, what's the deal with unanswered prayer? I'm a huge Dallas Cowboy fan, so I have prayed many unanswered prayers. <laughs> so what do you do with this so-called unanswered prayer whenever you're thinking, you know, I really have been praying a long time for my husband to pay attention to me or for my spouse to come to church with me, and there is no movement. I've been praying a long time for another job, or I'm in between jobs. I've been praying for this for a long time, and it's taken a lot longer than I thought it would take. And I'm trying to be fervent in my prayers. I've been wanting to invite my friend to come to church, and I do. I want my friend to become a follower of Jesus Christ. But every time I mention Jesus or the church, they get so resistant in, in response. I've been praying for a friend to be healed, and nothing hap has happened. We've been praying ever since he or she uh, got the report, and now it's been a year, 18 months later, and nothing seems to be happened. What do you do with so-called unanswered prayer? Well, I've got some things this morning that I think will help. And one is, when it comes to unanswered prayer, God wants you to be persistent. God wants us to be persistent in our prayer lives. There's a story that he tells in Matthew chapter 7 where there's this guy that comes along and he begins to knock on the door and he is just knocking like crazy and he won't give up knocking. He just keeps knocking on the door over and over and over and over again. And Jesus uses that example to talk about how he wants us to be in prayer. And he says in verse 7, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. He wants us to keep seeking and keep knocking and keep coming. Be persistent in your prayer life. Even if you haven't prayed about it in a long time, you just gave up because God didn't answer it. Or even if you've been praying about it for quite a while, but you're kind of doubting right now, he says, if that's where you are, be persistent. Keep on knocking. Keep coming at me with this request. And Jesus, I think God wants us to be persistent. I think God says, when we are persistent in our prayer life, God will answer that prayer. It may not be the answer you want, but God will answer that prayer. So be persistent. It pays off. When Abraham Lincoln was 21 years old, he failed at his first business. When he was 22 years old, he lost a legislation race. When he was 24 years old, he failed at his second business. When he was 26 years old, he had to mourn the loss of his sweetheart. When he was 27 years old, he had a nervous breakdown. When he was 34 years old, he lost a congressional bid for office. When he was... 45 years old, he lost a senatorial race. When he was 47 years old, he lost his bid to become vice president. When he was 49 years old, he lost another senatorial race. And when he was 52 years old, he became the president of the United States. It pays to be persistent. And so God says the very first thing when it comes to this so-called unanswered prayer is I want you to be persistent and the second thing you're going to love this sometimes God says yes 
Sometimes he says yes. That's why it's so great to keep a prayer journal. Uh, last week we had several printed up and we're out of them. And so we put it online for people to follow, uh, ccrespond.com, and you can pull up the 21 prayer journal and join us in prayer. But the great thing about a journal is that you get to keep it and you get to store it away and six months later go back to it and open it up and say, this is where God answered my prayer. Here's where he said yes, because sometimes God says yes. He says in, verse, uh, in Psalm 116, verse 1, he says, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. God is listening. God hears us. 2 Corinthians 1, and verse 20. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ Jesus, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. Amen means yes and let it be. Whenever you're in a song that you're singing on stage or you're singing from, from, uh, while you're standing out in the audience, whenever you say amen, you're saying yes and let it be. Whenever the preacher is preaching and you say amen, what you're saying is yes and let it be. And now would be a great time for you to say amen. amen. I was hoping you'd follow through. I'm so glad. Well, every time God says yes... He attaches a responsibility to that. So sometimes to our prayer life, God says, yes, I'm going to answer that prayer and you're going to like my answer, but there is a responsibility that is attached to that. So 11 years ago, when Greg and I were thinking about coming here and being co-pastors at Christ Church, we were praying about it and talking to each other about it. God, what do you want us to do? We were both at places that we absolutely loved. And God, to our prayer, said, yes, I want you to go. And so we said yes, and we came. But along with God's yes to our prayer came a responsibility, a heavy responsibility for both of us that we still feel today. God said yes, but there was a responsibility attached to that. Some of you are single and you've been praying about uh, for God to send you a follower of Jesus Christ that could one day be your mate. And God says yes to that. But along with that yes comes a responsibility to that. You want to have a child. And sadly, not every couple is uh, given the blessing of a child for whatever reason. We may not know until we get to heaven and can ask God. But maybe you've been asking that in prayer, and God blesses you with a child. He says yes to your request, and along with that comes a responsibility for you to raise that child up in the Lord. So when it comes to these, these so-called unanswered prayers, be persistent. Get back to it. Bring it back up. Keep on knocking, and then know that sometimes God says yes. And then sometimes God says Wait. Just wait. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous uh, be shaken. While you wait, just know that God is going to sustain you and that's going to be enough. It used to be this way. I think COVID kind of, there have been some adjustments that have been made. But I remember most of my life, whenever I got sick, I would go to the doctor and I would check in, and there they would place you in a room that's called what? It's a waiting room. And you wait there, and you think it takes longer than it should, and you think it takes longer than it could have. And finally, they call your name, and you're very excited, where you go to another smaller room and wait. It's waiting room number two. And then finally, the doctor comes in and sees you and does what the doctor uh, can only do. But I think we feel the same way about being in the waiting room with God, that, uh, God, this is taking a lot longer than it should, and it's taking a lot longer than it could have. And God is just saying, just wait. Just wait. And Paul says something very interesting in Philippians about this. He says in verse 10, now notice the passion that Paul has as he is writing this to the church in Philippi. He says, no matter what, he's writing this in a prison cell. So what Paul is saying is, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I mean, he's saying, 
I'm here in prison, and yet I still want to know Christ. I want to be associated with the resurrection of his death. And the question is, even if you don't get what you want, while you wait, are you still willing to be faithful? Are you still willing to commit yourself to God in doing what God wants you to do? Even when you are waiting, are you still willing to sing and pour your heart out to God? Even when you're waiting, are you still willing to use your gifts in service to others and to bring glory to God? Even in your waiting, Keith, are you still willing to preach your little heart out? Even in your waiting, are you still willing to parent as best as you know how, waiting on God, seeing what his answer is going to be? Are you still willing to commit and be faithful in the midst of waiting? Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. While we wait, this is not a, this is not a passive waiting. This is an active waiting. Is there anything that God is wanting you to do or leading you to do while you wait? even when you're not getting the answer right now that you want. Here's what I think sometimes we do. This cereal is one of the greatest inventions ever. <laughs> when God said he gave manna from heaven... This may have been what he was talking about. <laughs> I love Lucky Charms. Now, I haven't had Lucky Charms in years. But you just wait till this afternoon. And I'll tell you how, how I ate these as a kid and as an adult. I was the one that would go through the box and I would pick out all of the marshmallows and get a handful of marshmallows and eat them. They are so good. I think they might be good for you. I'm not sure. But they are so good. Or I pour them in a bowl and pour milk on top of them and pick out the brown stuff and put it on a paper towel and then just eat the marshmallows and the milk. Am I the only one? Anybody here with me on this? Yeah, good food junkies right there. That's awesome. You know real food. So that's what we would do is we'd take the marshmallows out, put the brown stuff back in the box, and we were in heaven. And what I think God is saying to some of us is, I've really got some good stuff for you. It's just that you just want the marshmallows. You say, I want your help, God, financially, but I don't want to tithe. God, I want you to help me forgive all people, but not that one. God, thank you for the gifts you have given me. And he's saying, I want you to use those in the local church. And you say, I would love to, but I'm too busy or I'm too tired or this is not the right season for me. And what he is saying is, I've got all this good stuff, this brown stuff that I want you to eat. And all you're wanting to eat are the marshmallows that have no nutrition whatsoever. And while we wait, don't lucky charm God by only doing what you feel like doing. And doing the marshmallow stuff. And never getting to the really good stuff that God wants to give. You see, in our growth, there is a God part and there is an our part. We're a lot like Moses where he gets to the burning bush and God says, Okay, uh, are you listening? Because I really need you to listen to this. Yes, God, I'm listening. Because what I'm going to ask you to do is go tell your wife everything that I've told you, and she's going to think you're crazy. And then I'm going to ask you to go to Egypt and tell my people what you're going to do, and they're going to think that I'm crazy, that you're crazy. And so he sends Moses to Egypt, and he says, I'm not going to snap my fingers, and you get there, you're going to have to walk and work hard at that. You're going to have to go to your father-in-law and tell him that you can't be around anymore to run his business, and so it's going to really affect him economically. And so Moses takes off, and he gets thrown in jail because the king hates him. And by the way, Moses is the most wanted man in the land. And then Pharaoh is the most feared man in the land. And so finally, Moses tells all the people what he's going to do. They all think he's crazy. He goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. 
And Pharaoh says, you're crazy. So he doubles the workload on all uh, of the Israelites. And now all of the Israelites are mad at Moses because he has doubled their workload. But that's okay, Moses, because uh, you're going to go back to him, say, let my people go, and I'm going to send these plagues. And finally, he's going to let my people go. And so you're going to tell them, pack your bags, we're going, and you're going to leave, but then they're going to follow you because they changed their mind and they want to mow you down. And you're going to get to the Red Sea and you're going to be tired and exhausted, but I'm going to part the Red Sea for you. You're going to walk across the Red Sea. I'm going to fold it on top of all the Egyptians and kill them. And you're going to be able to celebrate in victory on the other side of the Red Sea. And Moses had to go through each one of those steps, waiting on God to come through. Is it possible that you and I, while we're waiting, you and I do what only you and I can do, and we wait until God does what only God can do? That's what you do when you wait. So with these so-called unanswered prayers, you're persistent. Realize that sometimes God says yes. You realize that sometimes God says wait And then you realize that sometimes God says no. And this is the part of the message that nobody really likes. Sometimes God says no. I wish that I could convince God to say yes in every situation, but if that were the case, well, then I would be God and not the servant. I've got to realize my place before God and realize also that God says no to everyone Sometime. You've got John the Baptist. John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. So they were tight, right? Well, John the Baptist got thrown into prison because he was hated by the king. John the Baptist told some friends, hey, tell Jesus where I am thinking Jesus might do something about it. His friends go off. They find Jesus. They say, hey, John the Baptist is in prison. And here's what Jesus said. Okay, tell him to be faithful. Well, I think he's hoping you'll do something about it. Okay, tell him to be faithful. They go back to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist says, what did he say? And they said, well, I don't, I don't think he's coming. Um, uh, he said, okay, be faithful. Is that it? Yeah, he wants you to be faithful. And John the Baptist was. A little bit later, he was murdered. Uh, He was beheaded, but was faithful to the end. Sometimes God does his greatest work in the no. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, Father, if there's any other way that this could happen, that I don't have to go to a cross and down a cross, if there's any other way, let's make that happen, please. Father, why have you forsaken me? And God says, I love you, but I love these people that I created enough to say no to the one who is most precious to me. And because God said no to Jesus, Jesus went to a cross and died on a cross for all of our sins so that now all of us can have a relationship with God, all because of what Jesus did in the no. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The question is, are we willing to be faithful even in the no? And you may have heard me refer to this so-called unanswered prayer. The reason I did is because there really is no unanswered prayer. I don't know where we got that from parents or Sunday school teachers or Garth Brooks or whatever it is. There is no unanswered prayer. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says wait, and sometimes he says no. Now, one more thing that I I really think teaches us a lot about prayer. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And six words here. Just leave this up for a bit. Six words right here. Uh, let us then approach God's throne. Whatever you're going through, whatever difficulty, whatever heartache, let us then approach God's throne. 
Who's on God's throne? It's not a trick question. Who's sitting on God's throne? God is. What that means is when we are approaching, we're not necessarily thinking about our difficulty and struggle and problem and challenges, not to minimize any of that, but instead we're approaching the throne of God so our mind is on His power and His sovereignty and His holiness and His provision. It's all about God's throne. We are in the throne room and seated on the throne is God Himself and God is able. God is able to rescue David from Goliath. God is able to rescue Daniel from the lion's den. God is able to give a child to a 90-year-old woman named Sarah. God is able to calm the storm. God is able to walk on the waters. God is able to part the Red Sea. God is able to, to harden the heart of Pharaoh and soften the heart of Saul. God is able to do abundantly more than we could possibly hope for or imagine in Christ Jesus, giving uh, to us his righteousness. See, prayer is more than just going into a room and sitting down and whispering some stuff that we hope come true. Although that's okay. And prayer is more than just sitting down at a lunch table or a dinner table and saying, God is great, God is good, thank you for this food. Although that is great. When it comes to prayer, we are approaching a room, and in that room is a throne. And sitting on that throne is a God, and he is a God who is able. And that deserves an amen. Because that's good news. No matter what your distraction, no matter what your difficulty, no matter what your despair is, we pray because God is able. Let's stand for prayer now. And just a reminder about Man Church. Wednesday night, I'd love to see all of you men there at 7 o'clock. God, you are able, and so we've all got stuff. we got stuff at work going on, family stuff going on, marriage stuff going on, relative stuff going on, uh, health stuff going on, money stuff going on. We've all got it, but we approach you because you are all powerful and mighty and sovereign, the provider of all things. You are holy and set apart, seated on your throne, and you are able, and for that we give praise. And it's in your son's name that we all pray together, church. Amen. I love you guys.